Amen. That was beautiful. While the choir is uh, making their transition, let me just uh, share again a little bit about uh, my experience this past week in uh, Nicaragua. Uh, I'm actually going to share tonight in the service a good bit more about it, but uh, just wanted to share for a minute. You know, sometimes people don't quite get a grasp of what money that is given through the local church to the association of churches, in our case, the Florence Baptist Association. What does that do? What does, what does that accomplish other than uh, paying the salaries of the three of us that are in the office and some other things that are, are visible, such as keeping up the, the building there and grounds and so forth? But uh, just so you'll know, there were, uh, there were a team of uh, three pastors and two laymen that went from our area, traveled uh, last Sunday all day into Monday morning to get where we were going. And uh, so what happened with that investment? Um, now, uh, one of the pastors and... and uh, the two laymen uh, took care of the majority of their own expenses. My expenses, of course, and another uh, of our pastors were, were taken care of by the association. So what, what, what's the bang for the buck, if you will? Well, about 50 Nicaraguan pastors were trained. Uh, Leo Carter, who is pastor of the Hispanic Church in the lower part of our county, who uh, we support as well as the Williamsburg Association. Uh, he is bilingual, former missionary to El Salvador, so he didn't even need an interpreter. And uh, he knew the culture, and he was able just to jump in with those pastors. In the meantime, I had a group, and we were in a special needs school. And so we were able to take some supplies with us that were helpful uh, to them, we had uh, one of the local church members who was a clown that helped us out. We had uh, another part of a team from Maryland, and so we were able to work with these children. While they were working with the children, I was meeting with the parents, discussing the biblical basis for their special needs children and what, uh, how they were blessed of God even to have the opportunity to have these children in their lives and uh, to help them biblically but also practically as one who has experience. So I was able to do that for two days at night going uh, to one, one village. It was not the end of the earth, but I could see it from there. Uh, complete with a a bug about the size of a, a fun-sized candy bar that fell on my head and bounced off on my shoulder. And being a good Baptist preacher, even preaching with a translator, I was able to flick him off and just keep going. So I'll share a lot more with you tonight, but uh, that's just a, a little bit of uh, what happened. Uh, you sent supplies into schools, much-needed schools, schools without electricity. Uh, provided training. I, I actually worked with the pastors about special needs ministry uh, for three hours on one, one day. And uh, so there was a lot accomplished in that area, and uh, we give, the, give God the glory for it all. Now, back to our series. We've been in a series in the book of Haggai, and we've not gotten very far because there is so much there. But in the first chapter, and we've been looking at the situation there. Basically what had happened is those who had been exiled, a remnant of God's people, the children of Israel, if you would, had been able to go back to Jerusalem. The temple was in ruins. And so rather than concentrating on the things of God first in their lives, they were concerned about their own well-being. And so they were giving the appearance and giving the evidence of being more concerned about their own lives instead of being concerned first and foremost about the things of God, especially after God had allowed them to live and also had brought them back to Jerusalem. And so several times in this passage we hear, Consider your ways. 
And that is God speaking through the prophet, asking the people to look at what you're doing, look at the focus of your lives, look at your priorities, and see where they are. And so in the process of that, in verse 8 of the first chapter, I'm reviewing a little bit here, uh, finally, uh, the Lord of hosts says, well, let's back up verse 7. Thus says the Lord of hosts, consider your ways, go up to the mountains and bring wood and build the temple that I may take pleasure in it and be glorified, says the Lord. Now, the next part of Scripture, he reminds them that uh, they're basically working with, with purses that have holes in it. As long as they're not putting God first in their lives, not only are their spiritual lives going to be difficult, but their physical lives are going to be difficult because they'll never be able to accomplish in their physical lives what they could if they put God first. And so we skip down to verse 12. In verse 12, we pick up after the people have heard from God, and now they are going to make the choice to be obedient. So there, uh, in verse 12, follow me as I read through verse 15. Then Zerubbabel, the son of Sheatiel, and Joshua, the son of Jehozadak, the high priest, and all the remnant of the people obeyed the voice of the Lord their God and the words of Haggai the prophet as the Lord their God had sent him and the people feared the presence of the Lord. Then Haggai the Lord's messenger spoke the Lord's message to the people saying, I am with you says the Lord. So the Lord stirred up the spirit of Zerubbabel, the son of Shealtiel, governor of Judah, and the spirit of Joshua, the son of Jehozadak, the high priest, and the spirit of all the remnant of the people. And they came and worked on the house of the Lord of hosts, their God, on the 24th day of the sixth month in the second year of King Darius. So what we find here is that God spoke through the prophet. He made the people aware of what they were doing. They were made aware of their condition. They were made aware of their priorities. And so now after they finally heard it in a way that reminded them that they were working to fill purses with holes in them, God got their attention, and so now it tells us in the verses that were just read that not only did the people begin to obey the Lord, but also that the people feared the presence of the Lord. And because of that, God gave them a promise and told them, I am with you. Now we've been looking at this in the context of the church today. And we realize there are many churches around that have fallen off through the years for whatever reason and now really need to be rebuilt. I never think of this effort that I don't think of some hu superhuman efforts, if you will. And so in thinking of this, I thought of one particular uh, man and what he went through. He's a famous man and unfortunately he is more famous for the mistakes he made than for what transpired in his life. Lance Armstrong may ring a bell. He was the seven-time Tour de France winner. He was four-time athlete of the year. But more than any of this, he overcame incredible odds to accomplish feats that no one had ever done before, and I doubt anyone could ever match, regardless of how he went about it. Because you see, winning all those cycling races was not as big as the battle that he fought for his own physical life. You may remember that he uh, had cancer, 
and the cancer had spread to his brain and to his lungs, and he had many tumors, and the doctors gave him less than a 10% chance of survival from cancer that had spread all over his body. And yet Lance Armstrong went to work on his physical problem just as hard as he had training for the cycling events to the extent that he was able to not only recover, but to again return to the form that he had known before. Here in Haggai, God's people were told how to accomplish the task before them. They had to rebuild the temple. It meant they had to get materials. To get the needed materials, the scripture says God told them to go up to the mountains. Now for us to rebuild, for us to rebuild perhaps our own temples, our own bodies, for us to rebuild the church as God intends for us to function, it will mean not to go up to the mountains physically, but instead we have to go up to the mountains spiritually. The scripture tells us in Psalm 121, I lift up my eyes to the hills. Where does my help come from? My help comes from the Lord, the maker of heaven and earth. And so may I suggest to you that any time that your life is in a position that it needs to be rebuilt, when it needs to be put back together, sometimes at first we need to realize that it's broken and it needs to be repaired and rebuilt. It's not going to come from anything that we can conjure up in and of ourselves. It's not going to come from some self-help book or from some program. But if we're going to find what is needed to rebuild our lives as individuals and to rebuild the church as God intends it to be, then we're going to find that as as we lift up our eyes toward heaven and as we look to him. So as we think along these lines, I'm going to ask you as the, the title of the message, are you willing to work and sacrifice? Are you willing to work and sacrifice? You see, our work requires going up. Our work requires going up, not so much in a physical travel to get the materials as is suggested here, but our work requires going up in a spiritual travel, a travel to a higher ground, if you will. What an appropriate uh, hymn to sing today. Moving to another level in our spiritual lives, moving to another level of our trust in God. You see, in our lives physically and as we live them out, there's one thing that is certain. If you keep doing the same thing, you keep getting the same results. Now, some have said that that's the, the definition of insanity is to keep doing the same thing and expect different results. The only way to change the result is to change what you are doing. Now, a good example of this is physical exercise. You see, if you were involved in some kind of exercise program, let's say lifting weights, and let's say you have a particular weight that you do an exercise with daily, and you just continue to uh, lift that same amount of weight the same number of times, after a while your body gets used to it and you plateau and you don't make any progress. Same thing with running. If you ran the same uh, uh, distance every day and just continue to do that or every other day or whatever it was and you didn't deviate from that after a while your body would get used to it and there would be no more progress it's one reason that something today called CrossFit is so popular because it uses all kinds of exercises. You might see these people with the big ropes and they're swinging them up and down or maybe the tractor tires that they're lifting and pushing over and it's going from a different exercise to a different exercise and your body never gets used to the same old thing and so your body physically continues to make progress as it is built up. So what kind of work will it take to rebuild the church? 
Well, it means a shift in our priorities. A shift in our priorities. God carefully points out to the people that their way of thinking and their way of prioritizing has gotten them nowhere. In fact, a purse with holes in it sums it up best. Now, in our case, we may not be talking about money. We may not be talking about how we are getting along in our lives materially. But we may be talking about the church. You see, as I work with the churches that make up the Florence Baptist Association, and as I have a conversation with others that work in a position similar to mine, and as I get calls from outside our association occasionally looking for church staff, I realize that oftentimes churches want to change staff with the thought that maybe that change will bring about something new. And in some cases, certainly it does. Sometimes a church may say, well, if we simply change the worship, if we change the worship and make it more appealing, and others might have other ideas about changes that somehow might help. But the biggest shift to bring about change in any church will not be just in the staff or not in some aspect of how the church carries out its ministry, but instead the biggest shift has to be the people in the pews. One pastor may facilitate better than another, absolutely. The key to finding a pastor that can equip and motivate the people is to assure that the people want to be equipped and motivated. Too many times as a pastor, I've heard somebody come along and say, well, you know, I'm just not really getting fed. Uh, early on, I, I didn't exactly know how to deal with this, but eventually I heard it enough that... Uh, I, I crafted a sermon, and basically the, the title was, If You're Not Getting Fed, You're Probably Not Hungry. And so often those that say, well, I'm not getting fed. You know, I've got children at home. They'd a whole lot rather eat Chick-fil-A than chicken and dumplings. But, you know, you can provide them what is needed, but it may not be what is wanted. And so we have to be careful along those lines. You see, there has to be a shift in our priorities. To make changes in our life is work. To make changes in the church of Jesus Christ is work. To make things that are important to you as an individual not as important anymore, that change is often hard. To make things that are often only a blip on our radar screen of life all of a sudden become important and maybe even a priority, it seems important possible at times but God wants things that sometimes cannot be seen and cannot be measured as other things in our life he wants those things to be on our priority list he wants you to spend time doing things that you may as long as you were on earth seldom see results from and this is not easy because we live in a culture that is looking for results. Now, I uh, mentioned, of course, the, my time spent this past week in Nicaragua. Uh, now, I was able to preach in several different churches. Uh, there were some decisions made. There were four that came forward and, and profess the Lord Jesus Christ as Savior. And so, so I can mark that. I can say, okay, those are four people that somehow the Lord used this old gringo through a Spanish-speaking interpreter to proclaim his message of salvation, and those four responded. Now, other than that, I was able to train some parents and also some pastors, and I may never know what came out of any of that. 
But what is important is not that I know what came out or if anything came out. What is important is what we find here in the scripture is that these people ultimately heard from the Lord, decided to obey, and accomplished the task that he put before them. And so that's what we need to be about. And if we're going to do it, it means a shift in our priorities. Building God's temple must come before our home. You see, the, the spiritual things of life have to come before the material things of life. Now, I'm not suggesting that you do like some have done through the years. Somebody comes with, up with the bright idea. They know when Jesus is going to return, and so they just stop paying their bills and quit worrying about everything and gather together on some rooftop somewhere, and that time comes and goes, and all of a sudden they just find themselves in debt and in trouble because they haven't paid their bills, and Jesus, Jesus has not returned. No, you've got to be practical. You've got to pay your bills. You've got to be honest by your employees. Employer, but certainly there is an opportunity to put the things of God first in our lives and trust Him to bring everything else together. Many spend much time, much money, much effort on our physical life. I mean, the things we wear and the things that we build and the things that we furnish our homes with and the cars that we drive and the amount of time that we put into our work or our business. Now, none of these in and of themselves are bad, but when our physical life priorities are ahead of our spiritual life priorities, we are not where God wants us. For some that, does, that, that don't know Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior, that means that they have not made the first priority change in life, and that is to trust the Lord for their salvation. For those of us that we have the saving relationship with Jesus, it could mean that you've not taken the next steps needed in that relationship to grow and mature as a follower of Christ. Now, at one of the villages I preached, a, a young uh, girl, probably early teenager, she stepped out in faith and made a decision to follow Christ. Her two younger brothers, and they were all very close in age, one came and then another. And in the process of following up immediately with those that had made a decision, uh, the pastor in that area who works with all of the other pastors, he came up and, and we got in a holy huddle, if you would, and he instructed those children quickly, we're going to get you a Bible and you need to read your Bible. You need to learn about the Lord. You need to come gather with the little church for worship and hear your pastor. You need to learn how to pray. And in just a few minutes, he laid it out so simply and yet for many of us that have been Christians all our life that same thing that was instructed to them has not been taken seriously in our own lives oh you see building God's temple has to come before our homes it has to come before the material things in life it requires a shift in our thinking the only way for us to initiate a change is to understand the need it's to understand the need. If we look at our life and say, my life is great, I'm satisfied, everything's good, then we'll not care to try to initiate change in any area of our life. But when we look at our life and I say, I wish this were different or I wish that were different, then we'll have a desire to change. So does this change of thinking and work all come together? Sometimes we change our way of thinking, but we don't put any action to it. You know, I've been through times I put my pants on in the morning and, oh, goodness, these pants are getting a little snug, you know. Well, if I go out to eat with some pastors and we go to the Mexican restaurant and I eat two baskets of chips and salsa and three burritos and everything, I'm not doing anything to help the situation. But if I take note of it and I say, okay, well, I need to back off of this a little, then I've done something about it. The, the shift in thinking has to be met with action, with action. The scripture sums it up as Jesus said, seek first the kingdom of God. 
And all these things will be added to us. If God is first priority and the things of God are first priority in our life as individuals, then as we gather as the church, then God is going to be first and foremost in the life of the church. So let's move along. The next main thing that I see here from the scripture is our work requires obedience. Our work requires obedience. You see, when we look there at the scripture, they had heard it and they had heard it again. They had been told, consider your ways. Ultimately, after they realized their livelihood was going to continue to decline if they were not obedient to God, then they made the choice to be obedient. God has very specific instructions for the Israelites. Go up, get the wood, come back, build the temple so that I may be glorified. These instructions came from God's mouthpiece, the prophet. Today we hear from his word. Today we hear from his spirit within us. And God's spirit is always in agreement with God's word. So indeed, if our work requires in obedience, then how is this going to come about? Well, it has to start at the top. It has to start at the top. There is not a church anywhere where there is a pastor who is disobedient and the church is going to be what God intends for it to be. Likewise, God has leadership set forth. And so we, in our families, God has a design. Now, I don't care who takes care of the bills. I don't care how the, the husband and the wife work together as far as who does the laundry and who does this for the kids or any of those things. But there is one thing that is absolutely certain in the scripture and that is that God intends for the father, the husband to be the spiritual leader in the home. So indeed, if we have a pastor in the church who is obedient, if we have those Men in our homes who are obedient and they're designated as the spiritual leader and they're leading their family not only by word but also by example, then we see how things begin to come together in the big picture. Not only must it start at the top, but it has to be properly communicated. You know, some people are self-starters. They'll go and see something needs to be done and they'll just get it taken care of and and go on there are others that need a lot of instruction they want to know exactly how it needs to be done they're afraid of making a mistake i've got one child like that if i say i need to i need you to do this this and this and if there are any questions address those then it will get done and it will get done well but if i just said go do this there's going to be too many questions. And so it may be different, but it has to be properly communicated to each person. A, st a self-starter may go ahead of God and try to do other things. Somebody that needs a lot of instruction may get held behind because of details and may be waiting on a word from the Spirit, and yet the word is already present in the Bible. God has communicated to us what we need to do. And if we will read his word and if we will yield ourselves to his spirit, those two are going to agree and we will have no reason to be disobedient. Well, here's the, the third main thing that I think we need to see here, and that is God will provide the encouragement. Now, I'm going to tell you everything I've said before is hard. I have struggled with the very things that I am telling you. As a pastor for 25 years, there were times when God wanted me to do things I didn't want to do. And delayed obedience is disobedience. In the home, it's easy to sit aside and allow my wife, because she's with the children oftentimes more than I am, to, to uh, take on too much of the spiritual leadership within the home. And so, yes, it's easy to struggle in those areas. But even as God's people here said, yes, we're going to go up. We're going to get what's needed. We're going to come. We're going to build a temple. We're going to put our houses on hold, and we're going to do what you ask. 
And God encouraged them once fear had gripped them, and he said, I am with you. The only way that you will make changes in your life is to be assured that there is a need for it to be obedient to God, and likewise, his promise is to be with you. His Spirit will enable you to make hard decisions. His Spirit will enable you to make decisions in your life. Through His Spirit, we're able to accomplish this. You know, my wife and I are very different. I'm a very logical person. I want to run the numbers. I want to think about it this way, that way, and the other way. And there have been situations in our lives as a married couple where I've told my wife, we need to do this. Everything makes sense. She says, it just doesn't feel right. She comes from that side of the brain. Between the two of us, we have one good brain. But you know what I've learned? Even though I can't explain it with numbers, even though it makes no sense in my way of thinking, more often than not, if she says that, I need to heed that and I need to say, okay, let's look at this again. Sometimes we look at God's Word, it makes absolute sense. You run all the numbers, there is nothing except an absolute positive or an absolute negative, and we know exactly what to do. Other times, God's Spirit is working with us, helping us to see the right situation or the wrong way in a situation, and it's communicated to us through His Spirit, and ultimately we come to a peace in our lives, and it feels right. Not only does it sound right, not only can we... Uh, back it up with God's word, but it feels right. Has God compelled you to do something and after obeying and doing it, you felt better? I hope he has. God will provide encouragement through his spirit. God will provide encouragement through each other. It's built in. We pray for one another. We bear one another's burdens in the church. As one has joy, the rest of us experience joy. As one grieves, we all grieve. And as we pray for each other, and as accountability is built in there, they are the keys in providing encouragement. Some are great cheerleaders. Others are great co-workers. Others are great spotters to stand beside you to make sure you can pull off a task. Others are good support staff, but all are needed. So here's the last thing. Our work must produce evidence or results. Our work must produce evidence or results. Now I want you to notice something about the scripture that was read earlier. It tells us that they went to work, basically. And it's well documented. It's well documented. What is the current evidence of the work going on in this church. I I just want you to think about that for a minute. What is the current evidence of the work going on in this church? What can we see? What is happening? Now, what was the evidence that we find in this scripture as God's dealing in this very specific situation? Well, the people came together. Verse 12 It tells us that those were in places of leadership with all the remnant of the people obeyed the voice of the Lord their God. There was unity. There was something that pulled them together. That which pulled them together was the realization that God's house, the temple, lay in ruins while they were scattered doing their own thing. So there must be that unity. They came together. We need people joining together in the task that lies ahead of us. They worked. They worked. 
They came together and they did the work. It says there in verse 14, And they came and worked on the house of the Lord of hosts, their God. They worked. We need to see those that are in attendance joining in the task. There's an old rule that pastors are very aware of. It's called the 2080 rule. 20% of the people in the church do 80% of the work. Okay? Now, depending on which side you think you fall on, how you're going to feel. But it's pretty much a reality. Sometimes it's because there are those that want to do and for some reason they're not allowed to do. Sometimes it's because others will do and as long as they'll do, I don't have to do. But regardless, what we find here is not a small percentage of the people going forward and doing the work to rebuild the temple, but that they all came together in unity with one task and with that task at hand, they all joined in. Everybody doesn't do the same thing, but everybody works toward the same task. Now, here's the absolute last thing. It's highly documented. You know, sometimes throughout the Old Testament, we have to put together a puzzle to figure out exactly when that happened, but not here. You see, it was so important that when the people said they would obey and when the people went to work on rebuilding the temple that it is documented here in Scripture on the 24th day of the sixth month in the second year of King Darius. Now I want to ask you now, how about right here? Has God given you any idea what he wants to do with his church here? Has God given you any idea about how he wants you involved in that? If he has, then you have a responsibility to obey and to say yes. I wonder if we could mark in time and document today, Sunday, August 13th, if we want to get formal, in the year of our Lord, 2017, could we say that the people made up their mind to come together and join in the task at hand, and that is to see God's church, First Baptist Church, Florence, South Carolina, go forward. Are you willing to work and sacrifice? Let's pray. Father, we read all through your word how you come to your people. You remind them of your holiness, your perfection, and your faithfulness. And in the process, they're reminded of their short-sightedness, selfishness. And Father, even as those who are redeemed, we're prone to wander. So Father, I ask now that you would speak to each of us. We've got a role. We've got a place. As we rebuild Father, as we look forward, not backward, as we think not about what has been or what has happened or who was involved, but Lord, as we simply look forward as individuals, and Lord, as individuals come together to work together. Lord, maybe today you've drawn somebody to yourself. Maybe the call for them has been to salvation in Christ. And Lord, I pray that even in the midst of this time and your spirit would speak, that they would come publicly and profess, yes, I need Jesus Christ as my Lord and Savior. Father, for those of us that we're assured of our salvation, we're assured and, and certain, but yet, Lord... I pray that your spirit would speak 
and we would understand where you want us in the grand scheme of things here. What you would have us to do. Lord, we pray for strength to be obedient and strength to put aside the cares of this world and focus on what you would have us to do here through the ministry of your church. Lord, any decision that needs to be made today, going in that direction, whether it be confession or repentance or just an affirmation, even as Isaiah said, here I am, send me. Lord, help us to be obedient. And we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. I'm going to be down front and be glad to receive you, to help you with any decision or pray with you as uh, we stand, as Julian leads us in our hymn of invitation.